Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. I was recently on an online auction site and I found this really neat looking old Bakelite radio. So this is one of the few Bakelite radios that I haven't worked on before, so I found this really intriguing. So I did a little bit more research on this and it looks to be a really great restoration and repair candidate to share with you guys right here. So I drove an awful long ways and picked the thing up and it's in really nice physical condition. So it's still in the box with the newspapers that the guy had packed in there to keep it safe during the travel. So I'm going to take it out of the box and put it up on the bench here and we're going to go through this together. Now I haven't looked at this thing since I looked at it in the box when I purchased this thing so it hasn't even been out of that box yet. So we're going to discover all the interesting little things that have been done to it on the way possibly or maybe it's even just left stock. Hopefully it's all complete. It sure looks nice on the outside. So let's get started. Let's bring this thing back to life again. Here's this really neat looking little Belmont radio receiver. It almost looks like it has a waistline. It looks like a belt on the bottom and then it kind of flares above that. Lots of character, lots of neat looking lines all over the place. Even what they've done with the little speaker grill here looks really good. So let's see if the tuning works. It does and it looks like it's one to one. Probably one to one. Let's see if the buttons move this around at all. Oh, they do, and you can see the uh, the knob moving here as well. That looks really nice, nice and smooth. Let's see if this works. Eh, not bad. Feels pretty solid. So so far things are looking really good. The little plastic window on the front here is looking really nice. So a little bit of polish would clean that right up. Doesn't look like there's any dents or you know nobody's pushed it. Uh, pushed in on it or anything like that. These are really easy to destroy. You know, just a little bit too much of a push and you get a crease in it and it's, you just can't get rid of it. The gold in behind here looks really, really nice. I sure hope that's backlit. That would look really neat if it was. So what I'm going to do is turn the radio around and we'll take a look at the backside. This is the backside and check out the scary line cord. Look at this. It's got these little insulators that slide up and down here. But there's nothing underneath these. So I think what's happened is these little insulators were underneath this tape at some time and they've slipped out. This is just normal line cord underneath that. And if you look right here, completely bare copper wire. Look at this. You see that? Right there. Wow. So I'm really glad that nobody tried to plug this thing and test it out because there would just be a shower of sparks and it would have probably ruined this area on the back panel here. So it has been preserved and you know, obviously people have looked at this and just gone, okay, that's really unsafe and haven't done anything. Look at this repurposed line cord. You can see a little clip here. So it's come off of something. Very scary stuff. So it looks like... There are two screws, a little arrow pointing to this one and an arrow pointing to this one and whatever's happened on the back here, this is all broken off up there. So in order to get the back off, we just need to remove these two screws. I've got bare wire hanging out here too. So remove the two screws and we're in. So what I'm going to do is just reposition the camera and we'll go inside this thing together and see what hides behind this really loose back panel. Here you are sitting right next to me in the lab. So let's take the back of this off together. So it's relatively simple. Two screws. I'll have to do something about fixing these things up so it holds the back steady when I put this back together right in the end. Okay, let's see what's hiding inside. That's looking really clean. And look at this. I'll show you this here. I'll just remove the antenna wire. They've got little clips that you can remove the wires from the radio. Most of these are soldered on. You have to desolder them to get the back off. So they're using a thing called a fawn stock clip right here and right here. So this one would obviously go to this side and this one was attached over here. Assuming that nobody's reversed them or anything like that. So I'll look for a schematic for this thing here shortly and go through this and make sure all of the wiring is correct. So look at this, they've got 
some form of a coil running down to a capacitor and then the capacitor to the chassis here. That's kind of interesting. So in this configuration, it would most likely be some form of a trap possibly, or maybe they're tuning something at a certain frequency. It'll be interesting to see what they're doing here at any rate. Again, I'll find a schematic on this and we'll take a look at what's going on here. So get this out of the way. So look at the inside, it's in really nice condition. Now, most of these old radio receivers are known as All-American 5s, so AA5s. This has six tubes in it, so this is known as an AA6. And the advantage over having one more tube is they've put an RF amplifier in the front end of this thing to really make it a sensitive receiver. So this should be really interesting to listen to, see how strong this picks up signals. So this would be the rectifier tube. So the line cord comes in and this changes the line cord, you know, the, the 120 volts into direct current. And then that direct current feeds all the rest of the tubes. So this is known as a half wave rectifier, 35Z5. This is a 35L6. So this is the audio output tube. Look at that, how loose that is in there. It's really loose in the base. So this drives the audio output transformer, which I'm not seeing. So it's probably hiding on the underside of the chassis. It's a nice big thick chassis. So this would drive the audio output transformer, which would drive the speaker over here. So this is an audio power amplifier, you could call it that. Now the tube that's usually next to this is the detector and the first audio. And it is the 12SQ7. So this will be the detector tube and an audio amplifier tube. The IF amplifier, intermediate frequency amplifier tubes, sits right between the two IF transformers. That's a 12SK7. This here would be the mixer and the oscillator. And it is 12SA7. That's its job. So, the tube that's right over here, furthest away, is going to be another 12SK7. It's just, that's the way they designed these things back in the day. Pretty predictable. Let's see. Am I right? Look at that. 12SK7. Wipe the dirt off that. There it is. So this will be the RF preamplifier tube. So this is what's going to give us some pretty sensitive receive. Let's see if I can get that back into the socket without looking. I can find the index. Can I find the index? It doesn't feel like it. There it is. So it's back in. Tuning capacitor right in the middle. Oh, look at this. So there's the lamp and it looks like the dial on the front is lit from the back. So I imagine that would have a horrible shadow because of this piece of metal here, but maybe I can do something. You see that in the front there? I'll move my hand in front of that. See if I can get it. If I, uh, let's see, how can I do this? I'll put this lamp in the front. There we go. Look at that. So you can see that. It's kind of translucent there. So maybe I can do something to light that dial real nice. I know for a fact that this is gonna that little bulb there is going to cast a shadow because of this bracket in the front there. So it's going to, you know, have a dark spot and all that. And I really don't want to have that there. So this is such a nice looking radio that I really want to enhance that dial. So I'll figure out something to light that dial real nice. So it looks really good when this thing is turned on. So that's pretty much the rundown of the inside here. Let's press some buttons and see this mechanism work here. You see little rollers on the bottom. That's really inventive. Neat old stuff. So I'll move this down here like so and I'll press this one here. You can really see that. Move that up. Neat stuff. I really like this old mechanical, just the thought that went behind that to make that work. 
You know, that's just, that's really neat stuff. Some engineers sat for a long time thinking, okay, how am I going to make this thing work? And how am I going to set these things so that they're right on frequency? So it'll be interesting to see how to actually set these to program them. I'm wondering if these just slip. That nah, doesn't feel like it. So there's got to be something to move these things around. Maybe this pulls out on the side or something like that and loosens these things off. We'll have to figure that out in the end. Obviously, these things are going to be, you know, presetable so that you can move them. So you can set your frequencies up in this thing. So that'll be an interesting little thing to find out. At any rate, so what I'm going to do now is move the camera around here again. And we're going to take a look at the underside of the chassis. So what I'll do is I'll most likely tip this thing up and... Uh, We'll take a look maybe from the top side down. I can get a bit better light on it that way. And we can get inside. It doesn't look like it's too hard to get in. I think it's just this here and this here. Let's see what's on the bottom side. Yeah, nothing there. Oh, maybe there's some adjustment holes here. There might be some adjustment holes here for something. So I'll have to find out what those are for. So yeah, it looks relatively easy to get into. And I'll have to remove the knob and probably all the little little knobs on the face here that move all of these little presets around. I have to get all of that stuff off and then we'll get inside and check out what's hiding underneath this chassis. I bet you it's probably original. I think we might actually be able to just get this all apart right here on the bench. So let's just try this here. It's tight quarters with the camera right beside me here, but so these things look like they're taken out by using some form of a plier just look like a knurled nut or something like that so yeah so those are that's relatively easy to get at it's nice that the bake light isn't cracked at all that says a lot so chances are this thing has some pretty low time or you know there hasn't been a whole lot of servicing done to this thing tubes look like a real mismatched thing and the back is tattered but hopefully this thing hasn't been taken out so that should loosen off on the chassis and it does so this will come out like this so let's take the knob off the side here hopefully this is going to be nice and loose it is I'll just let that bottom out There we go. Now these will have to pull off. Well, that came off relatively easy. This one here. Oh, that one is not so easy. You gotta be real careful with these things. You definitely don't want to damage anything. Take this one off. Whoa, that's tight. So what I'll do is I'll put this like so. Move the focus down here so see what I'm doing. So what I'll do is I'll use just a shop towel because I don't want to damage anything. I'll pull this down here. I'll slip a pair of needle nose pliers behind it. There's a bit of room in there. And make sure I get that shop towel behind this like so and then just give it a bit of a pry like so and look at that they pop right off definitely wouldn't want to damage definitely wouldn't want to damage anything on the face here let's try this one see if it comes off first by just tugging on it oh it does that's nice and the next one oh that one just came right off just super easy all right, so just a couple of them are kind of stuck. So we'll just pull forward on this. Well, wow, that's, look at that. No force on that at all. Okay. I think we're almost in. Let's see if this is going to slide out. Look at that. It does. I'll just move this over here. And the felt is even on the front still and everything. Look at that. The felt is on the front. Usually stuff like this goes missing. 
So that's nice that that's still there. Be very careful with cleaning that up. Okay, the moment of truth. Oh, look at that speaker. Oh man, that's just not good. It's not binding or anything. It's going to probably make some sound, I'm hoping. Look at that big hole there. Uh, so I might have to do a little bit of speaker repair work there. Yeah, the, it's not binding, so chances are it will make noise. So in the end, we can try that out, see how that works. Okay, so moment of truth. Let's take a look at the underside. Sure, it'd be nice if I could just find a replacement. Maybe I will. Keep, keep my eyeballs open. Here we go. That's looking... That's looking really nice under there. Yeah, there'd be the audio transformer. And I'm not sure if the solar cap... This is a usually sealed tight to keep the leakage in. See if it is. Oh, it's got a big crack in it. Oh, and it's burst on the end too, so it's definitely not kept the leakage in. It's actually the paper's loose on it and everything. Huge crack on the end. Solar. There it is. Oh, look at this. Sealed tight to keep the leakage in. You can see that there. So look at this. This thing is completely exploded. I bet you that made quite a bang at some time. Look at that, I just blew the end right off it. So, that's what happens when you plug things in without recapping. So, it's looking pretty good. All right, so what I'm going to do now is, now it's time to move the camera so we can get a real good look at what's going on underneath the chassis here, and I can zoom right on in and check out some of the originality. Here's a nice clear view of the bottom side of the chassis. So we just looked at this capacitor here. This is that sealed tight capacitor that's let some pressure out right here. And looking at this led me to this resistor here. You can see all the color bands are burnt off this resistor and it almost looks like it's shrunk in the center. It's got a bit of a bow to it. So if we look at this area here and we look just a little bit further right down to the tube socket. So one of the tabs on the tube socket that attached to one of the pins of the vacuum tube is all black. So it looks like this has been arcing to the connection on the tube socket here. So grab a flashlight here. And you can see how black that is right there. So they normally are nice and shiny, like what you see right here. These are nice and shiny. Solder's nice and shiny on that. Cobwebs or something in there. This is all black. So I think this has been arcing out of the side of the resistor here to this lead right here. So turning that resistor around would find that out. I don't want to reach in there and do that right now just because I'm pretty sure I'm just going to crack that right off. This looks like it's been extremely hot right in the center. We'll look at this resistor here a little closer in just a little bit. See all the paint's just coming off of that too. Just all chipping right off. So it's been extremely hot. So these resistors here are known as dog bone style resistors, or sometimes they're known as bed resistors. And if you can remember bed, B-E-D, you can very easily read these resistors. They're quite a bit different than modern resistors. So bed stands for body and dot. So the way you read these is the body, the end, and then the dot. So we'll go over here and we'll look at this one here again, body, end, and dot. It's the same thing with all of these all the way through here. So how you read these is, so the body is green, so that's five. The end is black, so that's zero, so five, zero. And then this is the number three, the dot is number three, so that's three zeros. So we have five, zero, 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 so that's 50k ohms. And they're all just like that through this entire chassis. So body, end, dot is how you read these resistors. So all the capacitors are going to need to be changed. You can see these are all waxies and, you know, there's no point in even testing these things. They're all just bad. Of course, this sealed tight capacitor was a molded style capacitor, but it's definitely bad. You can see it's just, you know, blown apart there. A lot of the times these mica capacitors are just fine. So a very quick test, or you can just leave these right in the chassis and then try the radio out with them. A lot of the times 
these capacitors, as I say, are just absolutely fine. Now, some of the radios used paper style capacitors and they molded paper inside these things. So you have to be able to tell the difference. This is an oscillator section inside this. So it has to be very accurate. So that tells me right there that these are definitely going to be a mica style capacitor. So when I dig up a schematic for this thing, we'll take a look and see if it has a parts list and tells us if there are any paper molded style ones. If not, when you start to get further away, if it's not in an accurate circuit, a lot of the times they did use a paper in a molded package like this. But from what I can see, the way that these are put together, I'm thinking that they're probably going to be all mica style capacitors. And again, usually they're just good to go. These capacitors right here are the filter capacitor for this entire radio. So when this large capacitor goes bad inside this radio, that's what makes them hum very loud when you first turn them on. So you click the, the unit on, the tubes warm up, and then it's got just an incredible buzz or hum to it. So that means that the filter can here is gone. So this will run directly over to the rectifier tube, which is right under here. So this might be shorted or open. You really don't know. They fail and in both states. And as you can see, this has been very hot, so we really don't know what's going on in this circuit yet. So a lot of work to be done in this unit to clean it up and make it work properly. A lot of the wire looks like it is this cloth style wiring. So not a big deal there. Whenever you encounter rubber wiring inside a chassis like this, a lot of the times that rubber wire is completely decayed and if it is decayed, then, you know, it's definitely got to be replaced. It looks like there might be some rubber wiring here going into the IF transformers, which isn't a good sign. You can see this rubber wire here, so we'll see if that's crusty. Yes, it is. So not a good sign there at all. Now, getting these IF transformers apart could be a really big issue. Look at this. They've soldered the cans onto the chassis. Uh, so we'll have to see what we can do about this. That does not look like a good situation. They may be hiding capacitors in there. Chances are they're using these micas here, so there's maybe a mica in there. Or these ones here, they probably just have, yeah, they have the tuning caps on the top, so this is probably going to be okay. So, yeah, that's looking kind of ugly. They're looking crispy, so I'll have to address these here in just a little bit. So definitely a lot of work in bringing this thing back to life again and making it dependable. Before getting started on any restoration, whether it be a radio or amplifier or whatever you're working on, it's always a really good idea to take lots of high-res pictures of the bottom portion of the chassis. So moving components around, take high-res pictures this way and this way, you know, one up here and all over the place and you want to move along, take lots and lots of pictures. This way, if something goes wrong and in the end, the thing doesn't work, you can always refer back to the pictures and find out if a wire or a component has been soldered to the wrong area. That can save a lot of time if something goes wrong. Another thing to take note of in a chassis like this is you'll notice that these capacitors have an outside foil end with a band on it. It's really important to take note of that in these tight crammed up chassis because when the engineers designed this, they want to shield the capacitors from other things in the circuit. So by having an outside foil end effectively shields this entire capacitor right up to this end. The outside foil end of a capacitor always goes to the lower impedance portion of the circuit. And as you can see, these look like they're somewhat in a series configuration with their foil ends. This, of course, being the lower impedance compared to this side, and then the chassis being the lower impedance compared to this side right here. So when you see outside foil, it simply means that the lead on this end is attached to the outside foil layer that's the closest to the outside of the capacitor here. So you can kind of look at it like shielding on a piece of coax. So this is tied to the chassis here. So this entire capacitor is shielded right up to this point right here. 
And in audio circuits, in many RF circuits where capacitors like this are installed in tight crammed up areas, having that foil end tied to the correct end could make or break your restoration. A lot of these newer capacitors, they don't mark the foil end of the capacitor, and it's really important to know that, again, in tight chassis like this. It could be the difference between a nice clean operating radio or a radio that'll randomly break into oscillation or you'll, you'll tune the dial a little bit and then all of a sudden the radio just gets quiet or it'll start, the speaker will start to thump. There's all sorts of different scenarios that come from just not paying attention to this. So I'll give you an example of locating the foil end on newer capacitors here in just a little bit. And again, this is very important not only for radios, it's important for amplifiers and definitely important for some very large pieces of test gear. So I have some test gear that is just full of capacitors that has the foil end marked. And believe me, if you don't take note of it, you really degrade the performance of the test gear. So we're gonna restore some test gear together here as well on this channel, and I'll show you how to do this, and again, take note of the foil side in that stuff as well. So anyways, we'll come back to this here in just a little bit. I'll show you what I'm gonna do here. So I'll desolder this area right here first. So grab a roll of solder. It's always good to add a little bit of solder to this here, and it just makes thermal continuity a little bit better so this connections melt just a little bit easier. So I'm going to use this Heiko FR300. Wonderful tool. I really, really like this thing. The only downside of this thing is, is they have a lamp here that cycles. So I don't know if you can see this. It'll come on when they see how it's on right now and it goes off. So this is cycling. So when you put this thing in the holder and it sits down in the holder like this, there are no lights to tell you that this thing has been left on. So this thing will sit in a holder. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna do a modification where there is a really bright LED on the end of this thing so that it's very easy to see if this thing is left on. Believe me, I've had this thing in the holder and I've left it on for long periods of time, not by choice, just because you can't see this. This is facing in like this. I have no idea why Heiko didn't put some sort of an indicator light here to tell you that the thing has been left on. So Heiko, if you're watching this, you might want to do that in the future. Put a little lamp on here so that you can see either cycle or just when you turn the thing on, just have the LED glow so that way you know the thing is on so that there's power applied to it. So anyways, back to the circuit here. So what I'm going to do is just apply this in here like so and heat the pin up. A lot of this older solder is tough stuff to get to melt. So you want to heat the pin thoroughly like so. And just desolder it like that. And then you can just peel the lead back. What they've done is they folded the leads over in this. Boy, are they ever tight. Let's move that back like so, move this back like so. There is a lot of solder on there. Now I can actually remove the tube from the socket. I work on these things all the time. You can leave the tube, so the actual tube in the socket and nothing affects the tube. It's absolutely fine. This is a lot of solder on here and I'm gonna have to apply a lot of heat so we'll get rid of this. You can see that there's quite a thermal relief from this all the way over to the actual contact on the socket. So usually not a big deal. Again, I'm gonna apply a lot of heat so I'll just remove the tube. If you're you know, soldering in a resistor, a quick resistor or something like that, a lot of the times there is no need to remove a tube done it for years, never had a single problem, never damaged a single tube, never desoldered one of the actual, you know, pins. So, come back in here again. And melt some of this. And there's a, just a huge chunk of that stuff on here. Lots of solder they've added.
lots and lots of solder on there. One of the things that you really need to be leery of too when you're working on something like this is after you clip something or after they've even put things together, boy, these leads are rough. These things are in here. Okay, so what they've done is they've actually used this one capacitor that I'm trying to get out to bridge over to this other portion of the socket as I'm twisting this. This is twisting right here. So what I'm going to have to do is just cut that because I don't want to have to run a new bridge wire. So I'll get under here, the next one here, this one here should come out though. So I'll just get this one out of the way. Just move that out of the way, look at that. Looks like it has blown a hole in the end of this thing as well. It's all brown and discolored in there, see that? Lots of bad caps in this thing. So what I'll do is I'll heat this one up again and wrestle with it. Again, you want to be careful with the tips on these things. You really don't want to scrape the plating on the end. There is a plating on the ends of all of these tips. And even, you know, just soldering irons in general have that plating. You got to be really, really careful. Okay. Let's see now. So much solder on this. Move that down under there. And I'll just pull this, actually I'll grab my pliers, grab a pair of pliers over here, and I'll just pull this through that socket, well there it came right out. So just desoldered that, and then what I'll do is, I'm as I'm going through this, I'm going to clean the holes up in these sockets. A lot of people, what they want to do is they want to cut these and leave a little bit, and they use kind of like a J-hook idea. That's okay, eh, it looks a little bit messy and I don't like that. I like to use the existing tube socket. So I'll vacuum the solder out and move some things over, like move any wires or leads over so that there's a hole there and I'll poke my new capacitor through there in that way, it just keeps things so much cleaner. When you see these things and either J hooked all over the place underneath the chassis, it just, it just I don't know, it doesn't look very nice. So now what I can see already is, look at these wires on the bottom side. So there's a wires coming out of the IF transformer and you can see they're just, you know, the insulation is right off of these things. See that? So I'm hoping that since it is, nothing is shorted to the chassis. That one looks like it's right on the chassis. If you can see that there. It looks like it's right on the chassis. You can see the wires exposed right there. So hopefully the IF transformers aren't open. If they are, I'll have to go in there and address that as well. So yeah, definitely lots of work going on with this thing. This uh, sure looked to be in nice condition, but um, the way it's turning out, it's uh, pretty electrically ugly. So I'm going to go through here and I'm just going to do the same thing to all of these capacitors. Just, you know, vacuum the solder off, move things, you know. And of course I'll pull these tubes out because these, you know, you can see here, I'll just remove the tube when I'm desoldering this next one here. So I'll just push on the index. There it is. And then I'll go through and desolder all of these things. Again, not incredibly important. If you're just going to tack a new resistor onto here, you don't need to pull the tube. I've been doing this for years and years and years, and I've never had an actual, you know, a pin on the tube. One of the, uh, the tube pins affected by it. You can see that I was applying a lot of heat to this thing and the, you know, the pins are absolutely fine, right? But since this is just so caked with solder, like that, there was just a huge glob. And then of course I'm adding a little bit more to try and make thermal conductivity between the tip of my desoldering tool and the actual lead out. So, you know, it's just adding more and more solder. So it's just a, a safer idea to pull it the tube out when you're going to have a lot of dwell time with your tip in an area like that. Now that the components have been removed on the underside of the chassis right below both of these IF transformers, now would be a really good time to address the wiring issue. So if you recall from earlier, the wiring that runs up into these IF transformers is made out of rubber and it's brittle and it's breaking off. So I need to get inside these things to put new wires in and as you can see, they haven't made that process very easy. What they've done is they've flowed solder all the way around these IF transformers, excluding the front area. So 
Desoldering something like this is a difficult process and it could damage the surrounding components just due to the amount of heat that's involved in desoldering. So desoldering will heat the chassis up a whole lot more than just resoldering the can on. I don't want to damage the tube socket and there are some soft parts inside this IF transformer. So I figure the safest method to getting both of these IF transformers off is to take a Dremel with a really small bit and auger a nice little line right where the IF transformer meets the chassis all the way around in this solder here. The solder's nice and soft, right? So that'll come off nice and easy. Then what I'll do is I will remove both of the nuts on the bottom side of the chassis. There are two rivets here and two studs that hold the can down. What I'll do is I'll end up just cracking the solder. So basically pinching the can and cracking the solder around it. Then I can remove the IF cans. Once I'm done fixing that, flowing new solder in here will be a very easy process and it won't take you know, nearly as much heat as it would to desolder something like that. So I'm not really too worried about that. So it's interesting, you know, that they've put solder all the way around these cans. I guess maybe they figured better shielding or it hold them steady or maybe less noise. I don't know what they were thinking when they did that, but very interesting to say the least. So you can see it's all the way around this one here, and it's also way around this one here. There's a lot of solder on this side, so. So I'll get that process underway, and when I'm ready to get inside these IF transformers, we'll take a look at the wiring and how to address replacing that wiring. I've used my Dremel to get rid of most of the solder all the way around both of these transformers here, and I've clipped the wires on the bottom. So let's see if I can remove this. So I can do this. You can see it's already parted there. I may need to actually use just a little bit of force to get that up. Oh, no, there we go. And there it is. I'll just get that into focus here. Let's take a look inside this IF transformer. As you can see, the wiring is incredible. It's like cookie crumbs. It's just falling off the wire. It's so brittle. I would say it's almost like glass. You just touch the stuff and it shatters on the wire. So it's that incredibly dry. So you can see in the bottom side here, we have four wires. We have a red wire, a blue wire. We have a brown wire right here, and we have a yellow wire. We want to make sure that we put this back into this transformer shell the correct way. So you can see on the top side here, we have two screws. And what we can do is we can put it back together this way, or we can flip it 180 and put it back together that way. And of course, everything will be misaligned. The wires won't go out the correct holes in the chassis. And of course, you know, the solder line here would be actually the opposite way. So what I've done is I've taken a felt marker and just put a little dot right here and a dot right there. And then that way I know when I'm putting this back together, okay, put it in this way, not this way. Just that easy. So I want to leave as much of this crusty insulation on here as possible because it's going to help me identify these wires when I pull this out of the shell. So I can take a replacement red wire and solder it to the red terminal, same with the blue and brown and yellow, and there's a little bit left on the underside of the chassis as well, so that makes it easy for me to locate where the colored wires went without too much thought. If all the stuff cakes off and or breaks off, because it is like, it's just like, I don't even know, can't even explain this stuff. It's just like glass, look at that, it just shatters and falls off, right? So if this cakey stuff just falls off, you know, there is always the schematic to locate it and you know, stuff like that, but you know, why make things more difficult than they need to be, right? So this is a form of spring clip that just holds the core in the center. And what we need to do is push on the spring clip and just pull this out like so. And then the insides should relatively easily come out just like that. And that's what it looks like on the inside. So what I want to do is very carefully remove these wires 
Without damaging the wires that run into the transformer, I'm going to also check this for resistance as well to make sure that there are no problems with the, you know, the IF transformer before I put it back together because you don't want to go through all this work and find out that, you know, one of the coils is open or something like that. I'll check that out and then what I'll do is I'll also take this screw and move this screw back and forth just a little bit just to make sure that it's loose and that it's free. If you don't do that, a lot of the times, this is the only clip that's holding this thing in and it is a really soft core, right? So I don't want to be, you know, putting down force, pushing on those adjustments and trying to break them free inside here. I want them to be relatively easy to move at that point. And I'll also clean this up, I'll clean this area up. Now, if you're cleaning this, you got to be very careful because there are mica spacers under here. You can see that little mica spacer. If I can get a, something to point to that. See right here. This is mica right here and that you don't want to damage this because that spaces these two plates away from each other so they don't touch, right? Because this is forming a capacitor. This is a capacitor here and a capacitor here for the adjustment. So things to keep in mind when you're working on this, be very, very careful around this so that nothing gets damaged. Before I go about replacing the wires in this IF transformer, I want to make sure that both of these coils are okay. So the red and the blue wire attach to this coil right here. The brown and the yellow wire attach to this coil right here. So I just want to check their DC resistance. So I'll measure the DC resistance of this coil right here first. And as you can see, it's okay. 26.92 ohms, we comfortably call that 27 ohms. Now, we'll test the other one, which is this one right here. So here we go. 26.2 ohms. That is good news. So both of these are fine, they're not open. So now I'll go about replacing the wires. The new wires installed really easy and it's already put back together just moments later. So that was a nice easy job. One nice thing about the old wires is that they didn't hook them through the top, you know, little tabs that attach to the capacitor and where the, the wire from the winding joins in on the IF transformer. These were basically just laying on top and then soldered. So that was kind of nice. So there wasn't a whole lot of mechanical movement in removing these things, basically just heat the wire and this just pulls right out. So. I put the new wires on, that worked out very well. I also made sure that these adjustment capacitors were not frozen. And as you can see, they're just fine. You don't want them to be too loose. You want them to have a little bit of resistance when you turn them, because if they are too loose, you know, and any kind of vibration on the radio will cause these to move and the IF will go out of alignment. So we'll have to do an IF alignment on this as well. I imagine it's probably way off. All these old radios have you know, experienced some form of tampering through time. You know, what happens is the capacitors go bad on the underside of the chassis or a resistor opens or say a tube gets weak and then, you know, people take the back off and they see, oh, adjustments. And then they get in there and they start twisting things around thinking that they can, you know, turn the receive back up again when really they're just making everything worse. So, you know, more times than not, that's what's happened. So we'll go through and do a complete alignment on this little receiver as well. So this is ready to go back in. So now I get to do the other one. I'll get that one out of the way, clean off the chassis, and we'll get back on track to putting components in. We'll test some of those dog bone style resistors together and see if any of them have moved. If they've moved too far, I'll start replacing those as well. Okay, here's number two. Same kind of shape as the other one. Mark number two on there. So we'll do the same thing. Pull this clip out of here carefully. Grab these wires and just pull that out. And you can definitely see there's quite a difference in these two coils. So you would want to make sure that they definitely go back in the same spot again. Remember how large those other coils were? And these ones are much thinner. So this is closer to the oscillator tube. Very important. So let's see if move this up just a little bit lots of glare on that screen okay and i'll move the focus over to this thing let's get this out of the way i 
All right, let's check this out. Thirty ohms. So that one's okay. This one really had me concerned because there were some bare wires on the chassis. If you recall, you can actually see the cut in the wire. You can see that where it was tight against the chassis. You see the cut. Where did that little cut go? It's right there. That's the little cut that was right on the chassis. So this was wound, right? So you can also see on this side, there's lots of little dents and divots. So I was really concerned about this one. This one is the one that uh, had some of the uh, wires. It looked like they were just about touching the chassis. So not a good thing. That's the kind of stuff that opens these things, right? No problems. So that's the red and blue. Red and blue is 32. And the brown and yellow is 30. No problems. 31 if you want to round up. No problems. So the wires will get replaced on this. I'll give you an example of how easy these are to remove. So let's grab my soldering iron, move the uh, back into center screen here. Focus on here. Well, I guess I can't give you an example because on this one, they actually wrapped the wire. What are the chances? Well, maybe they didn't. Maybe it's just being stubborn. Let's see. Yeah, it was just being stubborn. So there we go. So no problems. So brown, I don't want to take any more out than just one at a time. You start pulling them all off and you lose track of what color goes to where. So brown is to this one here. Very simple. So I'll just grab a spare chunk of wire here. I got a piece of red wire right here. So I would just strip this and then tin the end and then poke that through the hole right there. So clean the solder off heat it up and just poke that through and resolder it and away you'd go. This of course being a brown wire, not a red one. It just, it goes so incredibly fast. Actually I have a piece of brown wire right here. So why not do this together? I'll do that right now. I'll just strip the end of this just like so. And see if I can get my solder in the shot here. I'll just go about tinning this. What makes a tinning process a lot easier too is if you use just a little bit of RA flux on the end here. And then it tins like lightning. Beautiful. So what I'll do is I'll add just a little bit of fresh solder to this. Like so. And I'll just heat this up and poke it through, just like that. There we go. And that's it. It's back in. And then on to the next one. Just goes that fast all the way around. And then I'll clean this up. It's a little bit crooked. Had to move this around here. Bend that back straight again. When they tighten these things in, you can tell they definitely pulled these down. You know, like you mean, look at this, you know, the can's dented because they tightened these things up so tight. They really wanted to make sure that there was good contact between this thing and the chassis. And that wasn't enough, so they had to run solder all the way around it. I tell you. Yeah, so I'll clean this up with a little bit of Windex, being careful, you know, not to remove some of this stuff. Uh, I may, in the end, uh, you know what cleans this stuff up really nice is Vim. So if you get Vim on a rag and then just scrub, they come incredibly clean, these things. So, and then I'll, you know, I'll end up wiping this number off, put it on the bench here, and I'll be like, uh-oh, um, and then I'll have to look at the coils inside. So that's what I'll do next. Get this thing back together, and I'll start cleaning the chassis. Actually, I'll show you the chassis here in just a moment, and I'll show you how I clean that as well. In an attempt to make these look just a little bit nicer, I did take some Vim on a rag and clean them off. It worked out really well. The stuff that you see that's left over is right into the plating and I can't take that off without damaging the plating on here. So that's about as clean as they'll come and that's, you know, it looks really nice. So not bad at all. So now I need to start cleaning the chassis.
So the next thing to do is to clean up the chassis and I want to remove a few things before I do that, which will make the cleaning just a little bit easier. First thing I'm going to do, this is driving me crazy. You get rid of this horrible line cord and into the garbage it goes. So that's out of the way. That frees things up quite a bit. Just doing that alone. So another thing I want to do is remove this little dial very carefully and I want to get that out of the way because if I'm cleaning this I don't want any kind of chemical to get on that especially vim or anything like that so I'm thinking looks like there's a little clips on the top and on the bottom hopefully I can get to the bottom clip boy those are tight That is really tight. That must be an awfully nasty spring type steel. It went in a little hole there. Yikes. So now what I'm going to very carefully do is try and get this carefully. Actually, I've got some that are just a little bit larger. Go for these ones here. And I'm just going to slip this behind that little rivet right there. And I'm just going to pull forward gently on this. Because these are nice and sharp and they'll get right behind it. As you can see, it's already trying to twist. So one of the sides, one of the sides here have popped out. I gotta be so careful with this thing. There we go. Well, that worked out nice and easy. So wow, that is so incredibly sick. Look at how thick that is. That's the reason that it doesn't want to press together. So obviously. When this is put in here, they're taking something and they're just pinching it like this, and it's opening these up on the back side. So I don't even know if I want to put something like that back in. I might put a really shallow screw in there and just gently tighten it up. So depending on you know how rough this is, I don't want to risk damaging this plastic face. So the next one is on the bottom, and that's going to be really rough to get to from the behind here. So, let's see if I can get that. I gotta go around this. And I'll just pinch this together. At this point, I'm not even really too concerned about damaging these things. I don't know if I'm gonna even put them back. That one looks like it's trying to come out. And I just, I don't wanna, you know, do anything like this because there's the plastic there. So this makes this rather difficult. One more time to squeeze that without damaging anything. I have to put this right in the center. Can't even, no, there's no way I'm going to get that around that. You know, this is just going to go click. Alright, I think that probably pinched it together a little bit. I think I can get. I can definitely get this underneath that and just gently pull up. Get this underneath here and gently pull up. There it is. So that came out. So now I can take this little bubble, piece of bubble plastic off here and I can polish that up. You see some scuffs in there and things like that. It's just standard. So I'll get that out of the way. I'll just put that over here for now. And then I want to remove this. Now, usually these will just pull straight off. So what I'm going to do, that's nice and clean. There's a little bit of discoloration on here, but for all in all, you know, from the late 30s, it's not bad at all. I'm just going to see if I can pull forward on this. This is usually how you adjust these. Probably need to do this for the alignment anyways. So, let me see if I can, yeah, it's just pressed on there. 
I really don't want to take any risk damaging this thing. Boy, is that ever on there. It is definitely on there. Let's see from the behind here. There's just a little bit of area. It's just a little bit of area right in here that I might be able to put a screwdriver in and then push forward by twisting the screwdriver. So I'm going to move the focus forward because I've hard to work way back over here, so I'll move the focus forward. There, so that should stay focused on this. So now what I want to do is I want to get this screwdriver right in behind here like so, and give it a twist, and see if that's going to move this at all. Maybe if I get another one on the other side. Might work. So let's see. Is this things that are flopping around all over the place here. So I'll put this here. And I will put this here. And I'll see if by twisting this. There it is. It came forward. So now I can probably just move that off. Just like so. And there it is. Nice and safe the way it needs to be. So I'll try and clean this very, very carefully. It's in pretty good condition. And I think, you know, with the window around, this probably won't be too noticeable. So that gets that off of there nice and safe. I can get the needle out of the way and I can clean everything up. Like, look at all the dust and crap behind there, right? So all this stuff needs to come off. Next thing I'm going to do is remove the speaker. I need to desolder some wires and stuff like that. And once I got that underway, I'll be back. I have the speaker removed. It was really quite easy. Just two screws on the bottom side of the chassis and desolder one wire. One lead from the audio output transformer ties directly to the chassis, so they have this one end of the speaker just grounded. There's only one wire running to the speaker. It really is too bad that this speaker is in such bad condition. Unfortunately, you know, if I was to fix this, chances are, you know, it's going to tighten up. I might get a buzzer around, and I really don't want to deal with that. So, digging through my stuff, found this. This box, carefully pull out this nice speaker. It's in really good condition, a little bit of dust on it and stuff like that. So you can see that this has a bracket on the bottom, but you know, it's nowhere near as far down as that one, right? So what I'm thinking is, what I'll probably do is just drill two smaller holes a little bit forward from these ones, so a little closer to the front side of the chassis, and put some standoffs and just lift this up to the same height and mount it in the same area and I think I'm good to go. Nice new speaker, should sound really really nice. So what I'll do is I'll get the chassis all cleaned up. I'm going to do this right in the end. I want to keep the speaker off of this thing and the dial off of this thing as long as possible because you know I'm wrestling around with the chassis and things like that and I don't want to take any chances in poking a hole in this speaker and I don't want to damage that dial at all either. I'm going to still polish up the plastic with some plastic polish. So I've got quite a bit of work to do in just cleaning this thing up at this point. So that should take a while, and then I will commence work on the underside of the chassis again. The chassis cleaned up really nice. So I used moistened shop towels, some Vim, nitrile gloves for my hands, a whole lot of Q-tips, and just a whole bunch of time. Now there really is no special method to clean a chassis like this. What I'll do is I'll, I'll take Vim and I'll put it into a shop towel. So those are those blue ones. I like using those better than just a standard paper towel because they don't tear as easy. So I'll, I'll put Vim in the actual shop towel itself, rub it into the shop towel and just spend time on the chassis and it cleans the chassis really well. No, I'm not sponsored by Vim in any way, shape or form. It just is a product that works incredibly well to get off all of that dust and debris that's been you know sticking to the chassis since probably the late 30s, right? So after I've done that, I'll take another moist shop towel, just a moist one, no Vim on it, wipe down the chassis, get all the Vim residue and everything off of here, and then what I'll do is I'll take WD-40, and I'll put WD-40 on another clean shop towel and go over the chassis again. And I'll clean up the chassis really well with that. 
Now, this mechanism here had a whole lot of hardened grease caked all over this thing. This is a really big mechanical setup over here, a bunch of cams and rollers and levers and all sorts of things. Really, really caked on dried grease. And it was just, it was really crusty and stuck on here. So WD-40 does a really good job in softening that up. So what I did is I coated this entire area with WD-40 and I let it sit for quite a while. After that, using a whole bunch more Q-tips, I cleaned off this entire area and it just came really, really clean. So the reason that there's grit and all of that kind of stuff stuck in this grease and that grease has gotten hard is because this little radio, when it's been in use, when you turn the thing on, it turns into an oven. The thing just gets incredibly hot. You shut it off, it cools right off to room temperature again. Turn it on, it gets as hot as an oven. So it's continually cycling when you're turning this thing on and off. So the grease is getting soft when it's hot. You turn the unit off, it gets hard when it cools down and it's just, it's just a dust magnet. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, how does dust get into this little enclosure? The answer is simple. It's called convection cooling. So when you have a whole bunch of vacuum tubes in a row like this, what happens is, is heat rises off the tubes because the tubes are really hot. Well, when hot air rises, it has to pull in cold air from the bottom. And that's what happens. So there's this continual airflow flowing through here just because these tubes are so blazing hot. Well, if there's airflow flowing through this area, what's going to happen? It's going to draw dusty air in from wherever it is, it, it, whether it's in your house or in a shop or wherever this thing is, it's going to draw dusty air through. And then that dust ends up traveling into the chassis and settling in the chassis and getting stuck in the grease. And you get this, you know, black cakey mat of grease all over everything that needs to get cleaned off. WD-40 does a really good job in softening that up to get that stuff off. And then after you're done, of course, you want to wipe everything down and get all of that stuff out of everything. You want to make sure that there's no chemical or anything left on the chassis. Again, I use nitrile gloves while I'm doing this to, to keep all of these chemicals off my hands. Use the appropriate glove that you would find appropriate to use in your situation. So I just have a bunch of these on hand and they work good for me. Now you'll see that there's a whole bunch of mechanical levers here with rollers. These little rollers roll on these cams to do the presets and everything like that. And these presets, if I hold the capacitor steady, you know, you can move these around. There's a there's spring tension holding these little brass pipes tight on all of these presets so that you can preset the frequencies and then move to the next one without it affecting the one that you've just adjusted. It's a pretty neat little setup here. But the thing is, is that after you've done this, you're going to want to add just a little bit of lubricating oil, a light oil into things like these rollers right in the center where the little rivet holds the roll roller on. You're going to want to put a little drop of oil in there on each one of these. Where the brass here meets this plate right in there, you're gonna to wanna to add just a drop of oil. There's a ball bearing in the front side of this tuning capacitor. You're gonna to wanna to put a drop of oil in there and a drop of oil right where this little center brass shaft meets the end body here. You can also wanna put some oil in there. Just places that are going to move. As you can see, like back in the day, everything was made with quality. These are metal rollers, solid metal rollers. If this thing was made nowadays. These things would probably be plastic, right? So solid metal rollers, everything is just metal, you know, nice, nice pieces of spring steel on here, brass shaft in here. You know, the thing reeks of quality way back in the day, you know, it was just good stuff. They put together good. Well, look at this has been around since the late thirties and it's still here, right? And it's going to be restored with ease and operate again. So it should be fun to see how well this thing performs. So anyways, there's just a, a few hints and tricks to, to help you clean your chassis and, and things like that. Again, no special technique to, you know, cleaning the chassis. I wouldn't go squirting Vim directly on the chassis itself just because I wouldn't want it to run down into the sockets and things like that. Because, you know, if it puddles and it starts to run down, you don't want to get it into the little holes where the, you know, the pins on the vacuum tube go into. So you want to keep these very clean. So it's a good idea, again, just to put it into a rag and then just uh, wipe down the chassis. Time consuming, yes, but in the end, you get a nice clean product like this. You'll notice that there is some pitting in the coating on the top here. It's mild. I'm not really too worried about that. Again, you know, when you clean this off with WD-40 and, you know, you get all the vim and everything off the chassis, that alone will, you know, protect this chassis for quite a while. So you want to make sure that there's no moisture or anything or any vim or anything trapped under anything, any little areas that it could get caught under, like you know, where something is screwed down to the chassis like this. You want to make sure that everything is nice and clean and dry because you don't want to promote any more corrosion or anything like that, right?
Let's test some of the dog bone style resistors in this old radio chassis to see how close to their original value they are, if they even are still. So let's start with this one right here. So remember body, end, dot, or bed for short. This one they've added a fourth color to, which is a silver band, which means that this is a tolerance band. So this resistor is a 10% tolerance. So the body is yellow, the end is black, and the multiplier is black. So four, zero, and since the multiplier is black, this is just 40 ohms. So let's see how close to 40 ohms this is. Here we go. Any guesses? 44 ohms, not bad. Not bad for a resistor of that age. So let's try this one here. Just randomly going through the chassis here. So five, which is the body, and which is black. Again, the multiplier is black, so that's 50, five, zero ohms, 10% tolerance. Let's see how close to 50 ohms it is. Not bad at all. The nice thing about these vacuum tube circuits is you can test many of the resistors right in circuit without removing anything. Quite a bit different from most solid state circuits. Now you can get away with this in solid state circuits as well, but you know, in older radios like this, testing resistors in circuit works out a lot of the time. You know, there are times when some resistors will read a little bit off depending on if they're, you know, attached across an oscillator coil or something like that, right? But most of the time you can just read them right in circuit. It's kind of nice. So this one here only has three colors, brown, black on the end, and yellow, and there's no fourth band, which means that that resistor has a 20% tolerance, and most of the resistors from this era were 20% tolerance. So whenever you see a silver band on a dog bone resistor like this, it usually means that they're pretty good resistors, high accuracy for back then. So brown is one. Black is zero, and since the multiplier is yellow, the multiplier is the number four, so replace that with four zeros. So one, zero, 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 zero. So that's 100,000 ohms or 100k ohms. So let's see how close to 100k ohms it is. Here we go. Ugh. Almost 147k ohms. That one is way off. So let's test this one here. So again, green, black, orange. So green is five, black is zero, orange is the multiplier, so that's the number three, so turn that into zeros. So three zeros, five, zero, 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 50k ohms. Let's see how close to 50k ohms this is. Ugh, 68 and moving. That's way off as well. Okay, one more. Let's try this one. So we got green, five, black again, zero, and then red, which is two zeros, which is a multiplier. So this should be 5k ohms or 5,000 ohms. Five, zero, zero, zero. Let's see how close to 5k ohms that is. 6.7. So it's looking like these things have got to go. All right, one more. This one's way up there. Body is three. The end is zero. And the multiplier is green, which is five zeros. So this is three mega ohms. So three, zero, 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 zero. Three megs, three million ohms. Let's see how close to three megs it is. Some capacitance in there. You can stop any time. Oh, come on. Well, we get the idea. So, it's surpassing three quite comfortably. So, yeah, they're way out. Most of them are just way off, so... Yeah, those are going to need to be replaced too. This uh, Belmont radio receiver is turning out to be quite the restoration. A lot of the times you can leave many of these dog bones in. And some radio receivers, they're right on or very, very close to. This thing is, uh, wow, they're all just way out of there. So obviously this thing has some time on it. Here's an example of just one of the very neat devices that I've designed and released on Patreon. There's many more up there. 
This is known as the SIF device or self indicating foil side tester. This is designed to locate the outside foil on all of these newer style capacitors with ease just by using the noise from your body to inject into the circuit you can very easily indicate the outside foil this is a very very sensitive device so i've got the gain turned way up because of this really old leaky capacitor this is one of the capacitors out of that older receiver and as you can see it very clearly indicates the outside foil end right here under all of this dirty wax you can see that the outside foil there so how this works very simply just clip this into the clips make sure you got lots of gain hold on to the capacitor with a couple of fingers turn the unit on and we're looking for the least amount of leds up here with the corresponding led lit on the bottom so these ones here tell us which side is the foil side with the least amount of leds lit not the most so here we go See, lots of leds lit the least amount of leds lit so you can see that this side right here is the least amount of leds outside foil end just that easy so i'll turn this around so now this side will indicate as the outside foil there we go Least amount of LEDs. Outside foil end right there. Just that easy. So this is designed to sort through bags and bags really fast. You don't need an external oscilloscope or anything. It's just all self-contained in this box. I'm actually working on the artwork for this box right now. So we'll have some neat looking artwork like the, on the Carlson Super Probe box, right? So that's coming really soon. So these newer style capacitors, they don't mark the outside foil end. So we need to locate the outside foil end of this capacitor. So all we simply do is clip our new capacitor into the clips here. We can adjust the gain if it's got too much gain or not. We can just turn this up or down very simply. I'll hold this with just two fingers and we'll look again for the least amount of LEDs. That was pretty simple. Nice clean display there. Nice new capacitor, right? Lots of LEDs. Least amount of LEDs. So we know that this side right here is the outside foil end. So what I would do then, shut the unit off, or you can just leave the unit on, it doesn't matter. Hold it just like this. I get my felt marker. Like this. So I don't deface the capacitor. What I do is I usually just put a little dot right there, just like so. And now I know that this is the outside foil and I would put this aside. So I have many of these sorted already because I've used this a lot, right? So this is the outside foil. So when I install this into the circuit inside that radio, this would be installed the same way like this. So you can see this is tied to the chassis here. You can see that clip. This end here would be tied to the chassis as well. All right, so about eight hours later, this is what this radio has turned into. Now, you might not think that, you know, this looks like a whole lot of work, but this was an incredible amount of work. So, where do I even start? So, I've replaced all of the carbon resistors with carbon resistors again. So, these are carbon resistors. They're just a more modern Allen Bradley style carbon resistor. So, I wanted to keep this as close to the factory as possible. And you know what? I'm going to even put a brand new line of tubes in this so we can get a really good idea of how well this thing worked when it came right from the factory. So it should be kind of neat. So all carbon resistors. So these are known as carbon composition resistors, not carbon film. These are carbon comp resistors. These are very accurate values. So I've gone to the next closest rating, which is just, you know, it's almost spot on. So, you know, a 47 ohm resistor to 50 ohms, right? And uh, some of them are right on, you know, 150 K ohms. This is 150 K ohms right here. So like a 50K ohm resistor became a 47K ohm resistor, just the nearest common value. So this should turn out to be a you know, very, very accurate representation of the way this thing would have sounded when it rolled off the, you know, the, the factory line. 
All the capacitors have been put in the correct way, so I've identified the foil side of the capacitors and I've attached the foil sides correctly throughout this, so that's very accurate as well. What I have done is I've replaced the line cord here with a modern replacement cloth cord, which is kind of neat. This is a polarized cord, so it makes things a lot more safe. They did something really kind of goofy at the factory. They switched the neutral side off. So they left the hot side attached and switched the neutral side off. So I had to change all of that wiring around just to make this chassis more safe. All American 5 radios have no transformer, so they are not isolated from the AC line. The only thing that isolates you from the AC line is basically the insulation of the knobs and the buttons on the face. So whenever you're servicing something like this radio or rebuilding a radio, it's absolutely essential that you have an isolation transformer on your bench. If you're unfamiliar with working on a radio like this, I strongly suggest you do your research before diving into something like this. It's fine to change all the components and everything, but the moment you apply power is when all the problems start to arise. Problems with not understanding how these radios operate and you know problems with safety and things like that. So if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Know how these All-American 5 and All-American 6 radios operate. Again, some are even worse than this. This is coupled to the chassis through a bunch of various components. A lot of All-American 5 and All-American 6 radios have one side of the line cord directly attached right to the chassis. So there is no isolation. And these things came with no polarized cord. So way back in the day, they didn't have polarized outlets. So there was no polarized cord. So you could plug the plug in this way or you could plug it in this way, which you know creates quite a shock hazard. So there's real issues when you try to attach test equipment to this thing that has a, a neutral line and a safety ground. And this is why an isolation transformer is an absolute must. Again, if you're unfamiliar with working on these things or you're unsure about working around high voltage, do not work on this chassis because this is very dangerous. I would say that these older chassis are more dangerous even than the, the ones with the transformer on them. You'll notice that some of their older radios have a large transformer in one corner. That, in a way, acts as its own isolation transformer. This has none of that. So you have to plug this into an external transformer that acts like that transformer on the chassis. Basically, it's a one-to-one -one transformer. So you, you, your 110 goes into the isolation transformer, and then this thing is isolated from your line. So if you're following along, definitely take care, and you're doing so at your own risk. Now... I'm very safe with what I do here, and I want to make sure that this whole thing is extremely safe. I've even added an inline fuse. I rewired the entire switch. This is a lot further than a lot of people would go. But I've re rewired the entire switch area. This line cord that I've added now is polarized, so the neutral side is the side that is closest to the chassis through some components. This line cord here goes through a fuse. Now, the fuse in this heat tubing here. So this is a protective tubing that will shield the line cord from heat. So the fuse that's in here is an absolute value. So it's a two amp fuse. So if anything goes wrong in the chassis here, if something was to, you know, majorly go wrong, this fuse will just go away and it protects everything. I just, I feel more comfortable doing that. A lot of people won't add them. I do. You'll see that this wire here runs down underneath this resistor down here. This resistor is a heat generating device. It doesn't get screaming hot, but it's hot enough, so it, the wire here is protected by this tubing, and this tubing is, you know, like kind of stuff that you find in toasters and things like that, right? It's, it ex resists heat a lot, you know, it's really, really high heat shielding. Just the proper thing to do. I've added a cord restraint onto the side of the radio, so it keeps the line cord away from this heat generating component. You see there's a lot of room between here. You can't see it because you're looking down on it, but there's a lot of room between this, and there's a lot of room between this as well. So there's room between the both of them and it's moved on a side. This here is a cord restraint. There's a restraint here and a restraint here. You'll see that if I pull on this one, it doesn't bottom out. This here can move all the way down to the clip. So there is a lot of restraint and it's held away from the heat generating components. This is screwed to the side with a stainless screw. Just things like that, things that need to be you know considered when you're trying to make a radio more safe for nowadays. Now, a lot of you might be saying, well, why not just throw a three-wire cord on it? Well, it's a little bit more difficult than that. You can try it out. If you feel more comfortable with a three-wire cord, by all means, put a three-wire cord on this thing. 
The problem with three wire cords with a lot of the All American Five radios is that if you plug the AA5 radio into a you know GFI outlet, it will trip the GFI just because there may be some current on the chassis and it takes just very little current on that third pin to, to you know make that breaker pop. Now, again, there is no transformer in here, so this is tied to one side of the AC line. In this unit, through through various components, there are there's a safety cap in here. It's an XY rated cap in here and things like that, but this is tied to one side of the AC line. So if you have a three wire cord, a lot of the time on an older radio receiver like this, if you put that third wire to the chassis, the radio just becomes an absolute uh, a noise detector. It's just detecting noise like crazy from the wall, it buzzes and hum. Sometimes you won't even be able to receive any AM signals. So again, it's that choice is completely up to you. If you feel safer with a three wire cord, by all means install one. That's, uh, that's a personal thing, and if you feel that that's going to be safer, this was issued with a two-wire cord. This was designed to run on alternating current and direct current as well. It's even in the directions for a radio receiver like this, and most radio receivers, it will say, you know, plug the radio in if it doesn't make noise for the first, or in the first minute or so, unplug the radio and take the plug out and just reverse it. So, again, you know, if you head it the wrong way, right, the rectifier won't, won't do its job properly. So that's the that's the way it works with these uh, with these older radios. Now I'll be doing a lot more restorations on different kinds of radios like this. I've got some very neat ones with transformers on them. I will still use an isolation transformer. I just feel more comfortable doing that. But uh, they have large transformers inside them already that do provide isolation from the AC line. But you know you can never be too safe, right? And again, if you're attaching test gear to something like this. You got to remember that if this has a non-polarized plug, there's a chance that the chassis is hot. So if you put a, say, the, the ground lead of an oscilloscope onto this, it'll blow the ground lead off if this is, if the chassis is hot, right? Things you really have to keep in mind, that's basically an oscilloscope safety tip. I just did a, a video on that up on Patreon about oscilloscope safety and all sorts of different things. I'm going to do a dedicated video to working on all American five radios just like this, just because of all the risks involved. Again, you know, this is old tech and this is the way things were put together way back in the day. So you need to be you know, aware of the way that these things are built and the way that, um, you know, the way that you have to service a device like this. And again, if you're unsure, please don't work on something like this. These radios can be very, very hazardous if you're unsure of what you're doing. So I've got lots and lots of time working on radio receivers like this. Lifetime's worth. So, at any rate, let's see, what else can I tell you here? So that's uh, pretty much the explanation for the bottom side. Uh, all the wires and everything that need to be moved around, I've tried to optimize everything in the bottom side of the chassis. All the wires are moved where they are. You know, the wire from the oscillator coil is kept away from this. As you can see, it's close to this capacitor, which ties to this point here. But this is the outside foil end, so it's shielded along this area here. This is all shielded because this just ties to an RF ground point on the top side of the chassis. So since this end is the outside foil, all of this is shielded right to this point, and this is close in this area, so that's shielded just like it was in the factory. And that's the reason why it's so incredibly important to pay attention to the outside foil, and you have things like this running close. If this was the other way around, this would be completely unshielded from this point right here, right? This would run right next to this. And this is another connection on that capacitor. So very, very important to note that in, in a situation like this, when you're dealing with oscillators and sensitive circuitry like that, all these mica capacitors check out just fine. They're A-OK. -okay. Uh, I did a leakage test on them. Probably the most leakage, this most sensitive leakage test that these things would ever see. And they pass all the leakage tests. And they don't appear to be noisy or anything like that. The carbon resistors that I put in are extremely accurate resistors. So these were used in military service a lot. And this is why they have all of these bands on them. These resistors here, a lot of the times, are more accurate than modern resistors. In fact, I will give you an example. I'll just randomly choose one here. Let's see. I'll put this on to the side. I'll just put the uh, meter onto the side here. I'll zoom out a little bit. So I don't think this is going to be too in focus, but you'll get the idea. This is a 100k ohm resistor here. Remember the other one was like 148 or something like that. So I'll just test this one here. Look at that. 
100.3 K ohms. That's how accurate these things are. They're just wonderful resistors, these things. So they're all over the place in here. There's quite a mixture of different resistors and all of them have been tested for their accuracy. So this should turn out to be a very accurate representation of the way that this thing operated, you know, way back in the day. Let's put this down here. So what I'll do is I'll flip the chassis over and I'll show you how I mounted the speaker and I've mounted a new speaker in here on some standoffs and I'll talk a little bit about the top side of the chassis. As you can see, the new speaker installed nicely, very close quarters to this variable capacitor here. So just fit my tuning tool between there and check this out. See this opening in the speaker here? So if they didn't put that notch in the speaker, I wouldn't be able to tune this thing. Now it's quite a ways from the paper. I wouldn't have to worry about the paper ever hitting it, but still, you know, very close quarters with the speaker. So that worked out very nice. I put this onto standoffs to get this to the correct height and spaced it to the front so that this won't touch the Bakelite case. And this is right in front of the actual, the cut hole or the molded hole, I should say, in the front of the Bakelite case. So that worked out really nice. I had to use some really tall standoffs to get this up to the same height as the uh, as the factory speaker, right? You can see that RF ground here, see that black lead back here, ties to this braid right here. So that's the outside foil end of that capacitor. Now, if you're looking at this through DC eyes, this would look really strange, right? Because this runs through a braid to the chassis right here. And then it runs over to this clip here, which is attached to the outside frame of the variable tuning capacitor. And that's on a huge L bracket that just attaches to the frame of the radio again. So if you're looking at this through DC eyes, you'd think, well, why not just tie this directly to the chassis on the bottom portion while you're running it to this midpoint here? Well, this is known as an RF ground and having the outside foil and tied to this and shielded from being close to that other lead that we saw on the bottom is absolutely crucial. And this is one of the traps that a lot of people run into when they're working on radios like this and they don't understand this RF ground principle. So I'm going to really go over this a lot in the near future. We're going to talk about RF grounds and why capacitors need to be installed. And I'll even show you some examples. I have some very sensitive radios. If you put those capacitors in backwards, they break into oscillation on their own. So that should be some interesting videos coming in the future here. So anyways, just uh, just an example of an RF ground right here, kind of a midpoint between the chassis and this variable tuning capacitors case. So this is a one wire speaker connection. So this has two isolated speaker connections on it. The other side has a connection like this. So since one side of the audio transformer is directly connected to the chassis, I just soldered the clip on the other side of the speaker to the actual speaker frame because it's grounded through the standoffs, right? So this is a one wire speaker connection at this point. In order to do the alignment, an alignment that can be pretty much done with any type of an oscilloscope, uh, I'm going to have to remove this from here and then just put a load across this. So an eight ohm load to the chassis and then I'll hook the oscilloscope probe across that. Again, with this attached to an isolation transformer. And then uh, I'll tune this thing up and I'll show you how easy it is to do an IF alignment on this with just the peaking method. Again, you can use any older type of oscilloscope to do that. In fact, it's kind of fun to use the older test gear to work on this stuff. So, uh, but anyways, I have a, a modern scope sitting here on the bench. We'll just use that, show you how easy that is. I haven't resoldered the transformer cases here yet. Again, want to make sure the thing works, haven't powered it up. So once the thing is powered up and everything is, is working, I'll flow another bead of solder around both of these IF transformer cases. What else can I tell you about the upper end? Let's see, uh, I still would like to add another dial lamp on here. This is a 47. So I'll have to figure something out for that because you know, it's only going to light up one little spot on the face of that... Uh, the face of the dial there so it would be nice to have it you know, lit a little bit nicer especially if you know you have this thing you know it, it kind of is a showpiece this this radio is in such nice condition be uh, you know playing christmas carols through this thing or something would be really fun now i've designed some small broadcasters they're a little unit with a couple of tubes in it and what that does is it takes say if i want to listen to christmas carols on my older radio receivers what I'll do is I'll put it into that little transmitter. So it's it's a legal limit transmitter. So it's a really small, we're talking peanut powered transmitter with a small antenna and you place it nearby the radio and it actually will transmit Christmas carols from whatever you want to play them on with stored on your computer or whatever. You can pump it into a little transmitter and it'll play them 
broadcast it through the air short range to your older radios. And, uh, you know, you can find a lot of this older stuff with commercials, you know, back from the 30s and the 40s in there. And it'll play the commercials too. So it is uh, it is kind of neat. And having this thing playing Christmas carols or something, you know, at Christmas time or just even classic music for that matter is uh, really neat. And it's uh, neat to, you know, people come in and they say, wow, an old radio playing old music. That's really cool. You know, because you know, the AM band nowadays is pretty much, what is it, sports? That's pretty much all it is. We had a, an old radio station here that would, um, an older style radio station that would play classic music, but uh, unfortunately they're slowly all disappearing. So when they disappear, you got to have your own transmitter to make, you know, to play on your all your old, neat old receivers. I've got some very neat old high fidelity receivers and they, they have a really wide IF. So they play the bass. They, they sound like... FM, like, I mean, they're that nice. So that's, uh, some of those older Crosleys are just incredible and, and things like that. But anyways, you really get to, to hear the Christmas carols through them through a really good broadcaster. Anyways, I'm going to, I'll show you guys down the road how to build one of these broadcasters. Again, they are a legal limit broadcaster and, um, you know, they just, you know, very short range so you can sit the thing close to your radio and it'll transmit over to the radio. So you don't need to drill holes in the chassis and run an external connection to, a you know, out to your computer or, you know, a CD player, MP3 player, whatever you've got, right? You don't need to do that. So you can just, uh, you can just transmit to them. So it's just like the old days. It's receiving a radio signal. At any rate, enough of that. So what I'm going to do now is populate the tube sockets with all brand new tubes. I'll reposition the camera without even retuning this thing. I'll, I'll put the antenna on the back here without even retuning it. Let's see what happens to this thing. Does it, does it work or doesn't it? Is it going to make noise or, uh, you know, what's going to happen here? Let's find out. Okay, here's a handful of brand spanking new tubes. Look at that. 12 SQ7. That should go right there. Let's see, what's this one here? 12 SK7. Right there. This one is, this one's stamped into the base. 12 SA7, it says right there. I'll go right here. Brand new Marconi 12 SK7. Too bad it wasn't more shiny like these ones. These ones are like gloss. Anyways, brand new one. 12 SK7, we'll put it there. So that'll be our FAMP tube. This is the 35Z5. And the audio output to 35L6. Now all I gotta do is clip the antenna onto the back, plug this into the current limited isolation transformer, and let's see if it makes some noise. Okay, the moment of truth has arrived. This is usually the most exciting part of any restoration. Let's see if it just makes noise at this point. Let's see if it comes to life. So I've got both the antenna connections attached. This thing is attached to my isolation transformer and current limited supply. And it's pretty much ready to, well, this here needs to go to the chassis ground as well. So I'll just add a jumper clip here. Reach over and grab this. Okay. It needs to attach to the chassis. It's part of the antenna circuit. Might even work without it. So anyways. All right, so now we're back on track. Let's give this a shot. So I got lots of switch mode power supplies around here. So I'm gonna shut a bunch of them off to try and eliminate some of the noise. So that's that. Let's see. Okay, current limited Variac isolation supply on. Here we go. Moment of truth. That's normal. The dial light gets really bright when they first come on and it dims out until all the tubes start to come into emission. It's very, very normal for Ameri all American fives and all American sixes. So as the radio starts to come into emission, as all the tubes start to come into emission, this light bulb will get brighter. So we can use that as an indicator that, yeah, there we go. It's coming to life. So far, so good. Okay, it should be warm enough. 
Ah, oh, noise. Noise is a good sign. The alignment on this thing is probably in orbit. This thing's probably been screwdrivered a hundred times since it's was, you know, released. What happens is components fail in these things over time, and people get in here thinking they can fix it by screwdrivering things, you know, and then these end up in space. You replace all the components, and the whole thing's way out. So, okay, I'll tune through the dial here. Let's see what happens. I think it's kind of quiet. Let's see. You can see it's trying to receive. I'm just using myself as an antenna here. Give it some more volume. Oh, there we go. It is Good sign. So it just sounds like it's just way way out of alignment that's probably a switch mode power supply around here so far so good i am happy with the results so the next thing i'm going to do now is do an if alignment so again it's probably way out in orbit not only that i went in here and i moved them around a little bit I tried to get them back close to the same spot but i moved them around a little bit to make sure that they weren't seized up one thing to keep in mind whenever you're going to do an alignment on something like this, when you see screws in a transformer like this, lots of times they're live. There's high voltage on those screws, so you need an insulated screwdriver to tune these. Something to always keep in mind. If you put a metal screwdriver in there and slip on that screw and touch the case of the radio, a lot of the times it will damage circuitry or the actual transformer itself. So either one side or both sides will be live. Actually, you know what? I can probably give you an example of this. I'll just turn this back on and I'll grab my voltmeter. I have to be really careful with my probe. Okay. So that should be okay. Hopefully that's showing up all right. Probably a little out of focus, but you get the idea. So I just put that negative lead, just lean the chassis on it. And I'll come into this nice and square with this probe. Right, like that. Look at that, 70 volts. So if I was to touch that screw to the outer case, I might create issues. So again, insulated screwdrivers, screwdrivers that look like this have to be used to tune these things correctly. Always keep that in mind when working on these older radios as well. I'm ready to do the IF alignment. I have the oscilloscope across a dummy load and the speaker is hooked up as well so we can hear that. This gives me the option of disconnecting the speaker if it gets too loud. The IF frequency in this receiver is 465 kilocycles. I think they did that way back in the day because of patenting rights and things like that. Later on everything just became a standard 455. But this is 465 so the signal generator is set to 465 kilohertz. And it's modulated by a 400 cycle tone at 50% modulation. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to feed that signal right into where the antenna is. But I want to disconnect the antenna so that I can get rid of a lot of the noise in the back. So what I'll do is, you can, I'll turn this up and you can hear it. So what I'll do is I'll just get rid of this connection here like so. Let that fall back. And then I'll attach my signal generator here and here. Can get a connection there without it popping off and that alligator clip is something else there we go so now we're just tuning for maximum amplitude that's it we can adjust the volume too you'll see that'll affect the amplitude because really we're looking at the volume now there's a bunch of noise mixed in there so you just want to find a, a quiet spot on the tuning capacitor and again, we're just going to tune for maximum amplitude. We just want to see the biggest signal we can get on here. So I'll start with this one here, right at the end. That's pretty close. Whoa, that one's way off. So I'll, uh, I can actually just turn down the volume here a little bit. I also want to watch the amplitude of the signal generator. I don't want it to 
overload this. So now I'm going to turn down the signal generator to about there, and I'll keep peaking this up. That's about its max there. Get this to lock a little better on that. So I'll do this again. Now I'll go to the next IF transformer here. Wow, so you can see how out of tune this is. I'll turn down the signal generator again. And you can hear the static and hiss getting louder as well. I don't know if you can hear that. So you can tell it's definitely picking up sensitivity as we're doing this. Look at that. Wow. So I started off way up in the millivolts. A couple millivolts, now I'm down to... 200 microvolts. I'm on the back one here now. Wow. Signal generator down again. As you can hear the static picking up. That's about the peak rate there. I'll go over this one one more time. And back to this one. If you pass it, you just gotta go back and forth. this one and I think that's about it it's maximum sensitivity and that'll be it you can hear it's trying to receive radio stations in there as well so this is going to be picking up everything, and I imagine it's probably picking up the CRT in this as well. Let me shut this off, see if that makes any difference. Turn up the volume. Well, it's not too bad. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. There's a power supply in here powering that CRT up. Mm, not bad. Now you can hear it increase just a little bit. Oh, now it's getting loud. So there are there are a lot of noises in here. So what I'm going to have to do is shut off all the switch mode power supplies and things like that. I'll just get that out of the way. I'll attach this little antenna back up, turn off my signal generator and everything, and we'll take a listen. Also get rid of that uh, dummy load on the speaker. So we should have quite a bit better. We haven't even peaked up the RF or done anything with the oscillator yet. Just the IF at this point. All right, let's see how well this has done with just an IF alignment. So I still have the load on here. I just left the load on and I've got a bridge wire running to the speaker. I've disconnected the bottom end of the load so it's not grounded out. So I have much more volume, I guess you could say. It's not seeing two loads at this time. So you can see how incredibly sensitive that is now from just an IF alignment. No RF alignment has done and the dial isn't on it yet so I haven't aligned the dial or done anything like that. To do the RF alignment the dial does need to be on the oscillator and RF 
I should say. So doing an oscillator and RF alignment will be the next. Lots of sensitivity now. Lots of stations in there. So it's definitely working very well already. And that's with no external antenna. I can add an external antenna to this thing as well. I imagine this thing would receive like crazy. You can see just me touching the antenna is really enhancing it still. So down here in the lab, there's not a whole lot of reception and it's just receiving off that little antenna on the back of the radio. And these are very directional, by the way. A lot of the times if you can't hear a station with a radio sitting in a certain position with this kind of antenna, you just rotate the radio like this. And a lot of the times you'll be able to hear that station a lot better. You can really zero in on it. You can almost use this as a direction finder. Here's a good example of why I want to fix that partially lit dial. You can see the lamps only on this side. You can kind of see it shining here at this point. So what I'll do, I'll put this right here like so. And what I'll do is I'll bump down the brightness here just a little bit so you can really get a good idea. of just how partially lit that is. So you can see that one side's really lit up and the other side is just, you know, it's dark. So to me that just, it doesn't look balanced. It doesn't look good. So I think one more bulb on this side should make this look pretty even. So that's what I'm gonna address right now before I get into that oscillator and RF alignment. The Belmont radio receiver now has dual dial lights. And as you can see, it really lights the dial up nicely. So that's how it should have looked from the factory right there. So that looks really nice now. It'll be nice to look at in a dark room. So the original dial lamp was a 47. Now this has two 1850s and they're attached in parallel. I'm ready to do the oscillator and RF alignment on this radio receiver now. So the adjustments that were just performed were on this transformer and this transformer. So this is the IF alignment. So these variable capacitors here, you see four of them, were adjusted to 465 KCs. Now it says here for alignment procedure, see instructions for Belmont model 635 series A. So that is this schematic here. I don't know why they just put this on the other schematic. It says here, connect B minus of radio chassis to ground post of a signal generator through a 0.1 microfarad condenser or capacitor, if you like. The reason they're telling people this is, again, because of the hot chassis on this. So this is the IF alignment, and this has already been done. So it says peak IF at 465 KCs, IF alignment conventional. So it's just a conventional IF alignment. So what I'm interested in is Adjusting the oscillator, it says trim the oscillator at 1650 kilocycles, or 1650 kilohertz if you like, or even if you like, 1.65 megacycles. Whatever makes you happy. It says here, trim antenna at 1400 kilocycles, or kilohertz, or 1.4 megahertz. It says lay the signal generator lead near, but not on the loop when adjusting the trimmer. So basically they just want the radio receiver to listen to a signal that's nearby. They don't want any type of coupling to this. So I'll get that set up now and I'll perform this portion of the alignment. I have the signal generator attached to the radio now. So the ground of my signal generator is attached right here. Again, this is on an isolation transformer. And the signal lead of my signal generator is just clipped above the antenna. So there's about that much space between the antenna and the actual clip. So it's just basically radiating a small signal out of this piece of wire so it can pick it up. So what I'll do is I'll turn up the volume, make sure I've got my signal generator to 1.650 megacycles. Now I'll scan the band and see if I can find it. I can't hear it. So now what I want to do is put the dial of the receiver rate right at 1650. So in order to do that,
So to my eye, that's right in front of the little notch at 1650. If you look at it straight on, little arrows right at 1650. Now what I want to do is adjust the oscillator to get that right at 1650. So I need to turn this little adjustment right here. There it is. That's the signal from my signal generator. Now what I want to do is I want to go down to the lower portion of the band and just check it out, see what the dial tracking is like. So what I'll do is I'll move this down to say 600 AM, right about there, and I'll put my signal generator to 600 kilohertz. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's a little bit high. So what I could do is take this plate here. Now there's just low voltage on this plate, but I'm gonna take my insulated screwdriver at any rate and I'm just gonna bend that plate out a little bit. And it's getting closer. So if I move this plate on this side out a little bit, like so, It's pretty much spot on 600 AM now. So that's how you adjust these things to adjust the dial tracking. So now what I'm going to want to do is go back up to the top end of the dial. And I'm going to want to see if it's at 1650 again. So it's right on 1650 right now. So what I'll do is I'll go 1.65 megahertz. And yep, it's right on. So right on 1650, I'll try at one mega cycle. So one megahertz. Yep, no problems. So the dial tracking is correct now. Now what I want to do is peek up the RF section. And in order to do that, I have to get at it from the bottom portion of the chassis. In order to adjust the antenna section in this receiver, I need to adjust the screw that's down in that hole. So this goes way down to the capacitor on that standoff there. I have a voltmeter right across C11 on the schematic here. So this is C11 right here. And I'm just measuring the negative voltage across this. I just want to get the most negative voltage at 1400 AM. So the dial on the radio is set to 1400 AM. The antenna is still loosely coupled in the back and the signal generator is also at 1400 AM. So now what I want to do is just drop this down through here, way down, and I want to turn this screw until I get the maximum voltage here. And you'll hear the volume get louder as well. And that's about it right there. And now the RF section is peaked up. So now what I'm going to do is get this back into the cabinet. I'll clean up the cabinet, put it back inside, and we'll take a listen, see how well this thing receives. It's late into the evening, and there's quite a bit of broadcast band DX, or distant stations, coming in from all over North America. So this is a really good example of how sensitive this receiver really is once it's rebuilt and retuned. So let's take a listen around the band. You gotta really ride the volume control because the stations, they, some are really strong and some are not. And there's lots of stations piling up on top of each other as well because this thing is receiving so many stations. Delicious and fresh chef prepared. And bless you. A chronic inflammatory. Uh, a large number. Oh, the jets get it. 
That goes into the and bless you. Hurricane Center. Maximum winds right now are to 70%. Traffic going through. Traffic over. You move the neck closer. I was like, no, I, I can do this. So Make some link closures. You can go through. So you can really see there's just so many stations in there. You could just sit here and just fine tune this and just really pull out a lot of those little stations that are hiding in there. Very sensitive receiver and it's working very well. So in order to tune these presets, it's a really simple process. All you need to do is just loosen that nut up on the main tuning dial, tune, push this down first of all. So you push this down and it bring you to a station and then just tune the dial on the side to where you want the preset to be. Let this go and then move on to the next one. So say I wanted to tune this one here, the second knob into 100. So what I would do is I would push this down and hold this down and then move this up to 100 and then let just let it go. So this one would be set. The next one, same thing. Say I wanted to tune this one to 120 here or something like that or 1.2 megahertz, 1200 KCs, whatever you want to call it. So what I would do is I would just hold this down and then tune the main tuning dial, tune this dial until it gets right onto the frequency and then let this one go and then do the next. Once all your presets are tuned, all you do is you just tighten up that little brass screw on the side of the main tuning dial and then every time you do this, it'll go to all your stations that you have selected just like this. So it works very, very well. Everything is, you know, working just like a brand new radio. One thing to keep in mind, there is a brass screw on the side of the main tuning dial that contacts directly to the chassis. That really is on the face and sides of the radio, one of the only metal exposed parts. So if you have one of these radios and it hasn't been restored properly, there is a shock hazard with that brass screw on the side of that main tuning dial. So always keep that in mind. You want to make sure that the radio has been restored correctly and that you know all the correct safety precautions have been taken during that restoration. So making sure that the line cord is, your new line cord is polarized and possibly a safety ground and things like that if, you're, if you feel comfortable with that safety ground connection. By all means, put that onto the chassis. Make this as safe as possible. One thing that would be a really good improvement on this radio would be to remove that brass screw and make a plastic replacement screw or a nylon replacement screw and put it in there. And then this way, there really is no metal exposed on the face and the sides of the radio. So that really is the only thing that could ever, uh, you know, on the face and sides of the radio, bring the chassis to the surface. Because everything else, as I say, is pretty much all shielded everywhere else. So something to keep in mind. So all in all, I'm extremely happy with this rebuild. Uh, the radio is just works incredibly. It's, it's a really nice sounding radio. And during the day, when the local stations come in very strong, it's just dead silent and just their voice. It's just crystal clear. So all in all, it, uh, it worked out very, very well. So definitely this radio here gets two thumbs up from me. It's just an incredible little radio for an All-American 6. Well, here we are again at the end of another successful repair and restoration video. I hope you enjoyed the repair and restoration of this Belmont radio receiver. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos coming like this in the near future. We'll be repairing and restoring all sorts of different electronic devices. We'll be taking a look at test gear, audio gear, we'll be restoring receivers, transmitters, all sorts of very interesting stuff. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well.
If you're interested in learning electronics in a very different and effective way, and if you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level, you might want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll have the link just below this video in the description, and I'll also post the link right at the top of the comments section. So click on the link and it'll take you right there. Alright, until next time, take care. Bye for now.